Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Happy Saturday. My name is Robert, and we are getting started in just a second. Okay, thanks for being here. Hold on for one second. Okay, and I'm gonna turn things over to our host, Sarah, in just a minute, but before we do that, welcome, thanks for joining us. This is Cooking with the First Ladies, and we're gonna be talking today about Rosalind Carter with Sarah Morgan. So let's go ahead and get underway. Just a few kind of introductory items before we officially begin. We always welcome people to introduce themselves. So in the Zoom chat or the Q&A, if you want to let us know your first name, where you're connecting from, and who is your favorite first lady or first ladies, if you have more than one, it's always fascinating to find out where people are joining us from and learn more about them. And when we do our in-person programs, we always have people go around and introduce themselves. So this is kind of the um, online equivalent of that. So you again, you can do that in the Zoom chat or the Q&A. And then we don't do a Zoom demonstration for these programs, but just real quick, there's usually only a couple things that people need assistance with. One is the sound. So everyone will be in listen only mode or muted, um, except for Sarah and myself. If you do want to raise or lower the volume on your session, you can check the settings locally on your own device. And then if you want the screen display to take up the full screen, um, if that's not currently happening because you see boxes that have my name on it, Robert Kellerman or Sarah Morgan, and you want to make those go away, you can look for something on your device called view or view options, which is usually at the top of a person's screen, depending on what type of device you're using. Um, throughout our program, if you have any questions or comments or run into any technical issues, again, you can utilize the Zoom chat and the Q&A features and take advantage of that. And let's see. And for those of you not familiar with us. We're Washington, D.C. History and Culture. We're a nonprofit community organization, and we're looking forward as the world is starting to return to normal post-COVID to resuming our in-person programs, which we'll be doing at some point in time. But even once we begin doing that, we'll still continue doing these live stream programs. So thanks for all the great feedback from everyone that we've received on those. And for those of you who haven't met before, either in person or online, my name is Robert Kellerman, and I am the founder and the director of the Washington, D.C. History and Culture Organization. But today, I'm not going to be doing very much of the talking because Sarah is going to handle that. And she has these really cool programs called Cooking with the First Ladies. In fact, this is the second time that Sarah has been on our program. She joined us a few weeks ago and talked about Grace Coolidge. Um, and so we had a lot of fun for that one. So we wanted to invite Sarah to come back a second time and talk about Rosalind Carter. Here is a picture of one of the food items that Sarah made for her cooking with Grace Coolidge program. If you didn't get a chance to watch that yet, there's a recording of it on our YouTube page. You can find it on Washington, D.C. History and Culture. And Sarah also does a lot of work for the National First Ladies Library. And I know she's recorded some programs with them as well. So um, if you didn't get a chance to see that, I'll send out the link afterwards, along with the cool recipes that Sarah made at her first program. Um, but with that, we're going to be talking today about Rosalind Carter, Mrs. Jimmy Carter. Um, and so with that, I will turn things over to Sarah. But before I do, if you want to follow Sarah and the work that she does, you can find her on Instagram. The name of her page is Cooking with the First Ladies. And with that, I'd like to welcome Sarah Morgan. Sarah, take it away. It's all yours. And thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and experience and passion of history and cooking with us. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks so much again for having me back. Um, and again, I'm Sarah Morgan. And so welcome to the Cooking with the First Ladies live program here for DC Culture. Um, and I'm particularly stoked and feeling, as they would say in the 70s, a little freaky deaky uh, because of course, <laughs> Rosalind Carter is still alive. Um, so it's one of the first uh, ladies that I've done a live program for that is actually still around. Um, so recently, there was this amazing documentary on CNN, um, which actually my mamaw told me about, so um, really turned me on to the Carter family, um, but it was called Jimmy Carter, Rock and Roll President, and that really inspired me to want to focus on Rosalind and the Carter administration um, for this particular program. 
Um, so in addition to the documentary, um, the National First Lady's Library biography of Rosalind Carter, as well as current news articles, um, as well as her autobiography, First Lady from the Plains, uh, one of her many uh, books that she has written, um, is where I kind of did most of my research. So that's where I kind of got some of this background. Um, in regards to why I started cooking uh, with the First Ladies, if you've never um, watched any of my programs before, um, I found a cookbook at the thrift store, Cooking with the First Ladies, um, and my husband influenced me to cook my way through all of them. Uh, so when the book ended at Reagan, I of course just kept going. And so now uh, it's so fun to be able to continue to share um, some of the things that I've learned with everyone. Um, so awesome. to start off, uh, there's really never been uh, any other first lady as impactful as Rosalind. Um, so just stay tuned um, to learn how to cook uh, Rosalind Carter's Plains Georgia cheese ring, um, her peanut butter pie, um, as well as her cornbread. Um, but uh, following as well, I will uh, leave some time for some questions as well. Um, and let's hope this evening for some of you where you're tuning in from or this afternoon, uh, depending, um, I hope that this program will be far out out of sight. Uh, <laughs> but first, uh, we are going to start this groovy uh, program uh, with a cocktail. Uh, now, when people uh, realized Jimmy Carter's campaign was more than just peanuts, uh, they started to become popular in many different forms. Uh, one of those ways uh, was a cocktail appearing in the peanut recipe section of the book, Miss Lillian and Friends. Uh, so one of the recipes that I will share with Robert later um, I will give you the original peanut butter cocktail recipe, uh, but today um, we're gonna make a little variation of it. But ultimately the Jimmy Carter cocktail was uh, developed by a restaurant owner in Wisconsin as a nod of course to Jimmy's peanut farming days back in Plains, Georgia. Um, it's a major agricultural industry in that area as well. Um, so again, the cocktail we're gonna make is a little bit of a variation, uh, but I will share with you the original recipe. Um, so what we're going to do is you're going to take one fourth part creamy peanut butter. Let's see. Wait, before we begin um, into that, Sarah, so just you brought up a good point. Rosalind Carter still alive. She's actually 93 years old. Um, so that's pretty amazing. And then for the screen share. So I'm currently sharing the slides that I have. Should I stop sharing so that the your video takes up the whole screen? Yes, and also after we make our cocktail, because um, it's a little different than my last one, after I make the cocktail, I do have a, a short PowerPoint presentation um, to share with you some history about Rosalind before we start cooking. So Okay, cool. All right. Okay, so I stopped sharing and it's filling up, you're filling up the full screen now. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so you'll take your one fourth part uh, creamy peanut butter, then you're going to take one part of creme de Crème de cacao, excuse me, liqueur. Um, and then you're going to take half a part of vodka. And also uh, one of my questions, um, the last time that I did the Carters was, uh, do the Carters possibly drink this cocktail or do they really drink hardly at all? And actually they, they really don't drink too much at all. Um, so then you're gonna take one fourth part of milk and then I'm gonna pop over here, put some ice in here. And then I'm going to um, use my immersion blender and um, need to grab a little spoon here because my the peanut butter is all stuck on here. I'm gonna grab a little ice um, as well as a frozen peanut butter cup, which is what we're going to use as a garnish. There we go. And I'm just going to grab this peanut butter cup. We're just going to unwrap it and we're going to cut a little slit in it as well once we uh, get to the garnish part. Uh, but you're just going to want to, of course, just mix this up. And my batteries are out. Beautiful. So we'll just stir it. <laughs> Excuse me, sorry. 
All right. Um, so we'll just stir this up. It works a heck of a lot better um, if you have your um, an, a small immersion blender um, or uh, if you have a shaker as well. Just going to pour it in your cocktail glass. And again, we're going to grab a knife and just cut a little small little slit in our peanut butter cup. And pop it right on the side of the glass if mine will stick. There you go. So there you have the peanut butter cocktail, Jimmy Carter cocktail with a little bit of a twist. Um, and uh, so cheers, y'all. And again, I'm going to step over to my computer and um, just share a short PowerPoint presentation with some history about Rosalind Carter. So. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. So I see to the right of the cocktail is Rosalind Carter's autobiography. And if you haven't read that before, um, I have read her autobiography. Highly recommend it. And if you're doing for some being really interesting, you should read Jimmy Carter's autobiography the same time you read Rosalind's. It's interesting to kind of see the um, comparison and contrast as they talk about different events that take place with the two of them. So Sarah, your screen came up perfectly. Okay, it, so it's good? Okay. All right, well, Rosalind Carter became the first lady in 1977 at a time when so much was going on, especially with technology and music, including the introduction of Apple and the release of the Apple II computer, the Atari gaming system, and the emergence of punk rock. Gas was only around 60 cents a gallon. The Carter administration followed the Watergate scandal, which uh, made many have more negative views of politics. And of course, during a time when the Vietnam War was still a major issue, which he addressed by pardoning the draft dodgers. The energy crisis and civil rights problems were also looming. Even so, the 70s had a focus on pop culture and people were listening to music ranging from ABBA and boogieing down to disco tunes, poppy songs from Olivia Newton-John and the Rock of the Rolling Stones on eight track tapes. They were also watching an equally broad range of films such as Saturday Night Fever, Grease, Star Wars, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The decade saw people young and old experimenting with marijuana, drugs, and the freedom to do what they wanted to do. Guys, as well as girls, were growing their hair long, and the dudes were wearing platform shoes, leisure, leisure suits, excuse me, and out of sight mustaches. Uh, girls rocked their peasant tops, bell bottoms, and not only long hair, but the shag. Military surplus clothes were groovy and pet rocks were funky. The Carter administration was definitely a rockin' one. In fact, they were more involved with music as no other presidential candidate had been before. And it reached an amazing amount of people, making it so impactful, which has now paved the way for Oval Office visits of Cindy Lauper and Lynn Manuel Miranda alongside the cast of his outstanding rap musical, Hamilton. Uh, rock and roll played a significant role in Jimmy Carter's election, and for the first time, Rolling Stone magazine became political. The publication even said that he made it the party people's party because the campaign reached out to a younger generation and for the first time felt like they were in charge. Although many did not really like his association with Bob Dylan, Willie Nelson, and others, the strategy worked. In the CNN documentary, Bob Dylan uses the Leonard Skinner lyrics describing his friend as, quote, a simple kind of man. Now, when Dylan visited the Carters at the governor's mansion, Jimmy quoted his lyrics back to him, and his music was played frequently in the house. Jimmy also said, quote, we have an America in Bob Dylan's words, busy being born, not busy dying. In fact, mere days before the election, Dylan played Georgia on my mind on SNL as a salute to the candidate. Now, the Allman Brothers probably played the largest part as they played concerts and helped raise money for his campaign. Greg Allman has been quoted saying, we helped get him elected. Uh, letters were sent to members of the band, such as Dickie Betts, that said such things as, my campaign is going great, thanks to good friends like you. 
The Almonds first met the Carters at the governor's mansion, which was described as the hippest governor's mansion ever by Robbie Robertson. And Jimmy greeted them barefoot and in jeans. According to Rolling Stone, the splashiest Carter benefit was a Florida stadium show that featured not only the Almonds, but also former Delaney and Bonnie front person, Bonnie Bramlett, who is known actually as the only Almond sister. Uh, now they netted the campaign around $280,000, which would be over 1 million today. He leveraged rock in ways no one had done before. Uh, the Carters brought a stereo with them when they moved into the people's house and were very excited when they arrived and discovered the thousands of discs donated by the Recording Industry Association of America. The Carters oversaw the upgrade to the White House Record Library, which had begun with Nixon's collection of LPs in 1979. With the help of the Recording Label Association, the collection became one of the most lasting contributions to the rock infusion at the White House. Although rock music catapulted him to the presidency, his secretary most often played classical tunes on the speakers installed in his office. Uh, Jimmy also liked to listen to his music on full blast but Rosalind preferred to listen just a little bit quieter. Uh, the Carters also enjoyed watching movies. And in addition to frequently escaping to Camp David, they spent a lot of time in the White House movie theater. They would order several films each week. And although Jimmy would pretty much watch anything, Rosalind was a bit more picky in the screening she would attend. Uh, I just wonder if they were tuning into comedies like National Lampoon's Animal House, horror flicks such as Carrie, or maybe a documentary like Grey Garden. I mean, if it were me, I would for sure be watching Dolly Parton in 9 to 5. Uh, Eleanor Rosalind Smith Carter was born in Plains, Georgia on August 18, 1927, and was the oldest of four children. She always went by her second name instead of her first. Some have claimed that she was named after Eleanor Roosevelt, but that actually wasn't the case as she was named for her mother's mother, Rosa. As a young girl, she loved reading and also enjoyed paper dolls, according to her biography. Her mother, Allie Smith, known as Miss Allie, became responsible for not only her children after the death of her husband, who died when Rosalind was only 13, but also her elderly father after her mother's passing. She took on multiple jobs in order to support them, including working in a grocery store, school cafeteria, and the local post office. Rosalind recalls in her book, First Lady of the Plains, she helped her mother sewing for others, including assisting in making an entire trousseau for a local bride, and remembers her mother sold milk and butter from the one cow they had. Rosalind also made extra money for the family by working part-time as a shampooer at the local beauty salon. She directly credits her excellent work ethic to her mother, and she is known as a skillful and hardworking woman who was actually still working at a flower shop when the Carters started their term in the White House. Rosalind also says she was raised to be an independent woman. Uh, she also recalls how her mother was in her teens when the 19th Amendment was passed, giving women the right to vote, and said she learned to understand how important that right is to have the ability to help decide on issues that affect the country. Ironically, Rosalind was born on the seventh anniversary of the historic ratification. Uh, Rosalind eventually graduated as salutatorian of Plains High School. Soon after, she attended Georgia Southwestern College, but later dropped out because of financial issues and obligations to her family back at home. She fell in love with Jimmy's picture, and as she described it, it was a fantasy romance. She wanted him to fall in love with her, but was so nervous when they actually met once he got home. She stayed in touch with his sister, Ruth, who she was friends with, and believed him to be the absolute most handsome man she had ever met. Eventually, after much seeming conspiring between her and Ruth, uh, they finally met. Uh, again, even though she was so nervous, because she actually just said she didn't know how the real Jimmy would be. Uh, he just wouldn't be the man in the photograph anymore. Uh, she recalls they were on a movie, um, at a movie on a date on December 7th, 1941, when the screens went blank and the announcement was made the United States was entering World War II after the devastating events at Pearl Harbor. During their time apart, he once gifted her a silver compact engraved with, and this is all in capitals, I-L-Y-T-G, which stood for, I love you the goodest at Christmas. 
which then he proposed slightly afterwards, to which she declined, thinking it was too fast. However, as we know, she accepted very soon after and are still one of the most endearing couple, couples to have ever lived in the White House. They finally married at the age of 18 in July, 1946. For the first seven years of their marriage, they lived in six different states uh, during his time in the Navy. Now, during her time spent as a Navy wife, she not only basically memorized the Navy wife handbook, but also sewed Argyle socks and baby clothes, learned to crochet, flipped recipes, as well as household tips, and listened to the popular soap opera, Ma Perkins on the radio, basically living as she recalls the life of a typical 1940s Navy wife. She was extremely content, especially in Hawaii, where Jimmy learned to play the ukulele and where their second son, known as Chip, was born. Uh, now, Rosalind remembers about Chip that when he was older, uh, when JFK was shot, he was so upset at school, he threw a chair when the teacher had a disrespectful comment about how his assassination was, quote, good. Um, although they didn't think that was the right way to handle that situation or the right thing to do, they never condemned him for it. The Carter family had always owned a peanut farm in their hometown in Georgia, and in 1953, when Jimmy's father passed away, they returned in order to take over the family peanut business. Uh, even so, she liked the adventure of the Navy life and wasn't eager to return to Plains, but Jimmy was. Although she described feeling miserable and projecting it onto others around her, she eventually adjusted by making friends. Rosalind handled the accounts and took over control of the business when Jimmy was elected to the Senate. Uh, they had four children total, Amy, Jack, James, and Donnell. By the time he was elected, the three boys were all grown up, but during their time in the White House, Amy was the youngest of their children. Uh, she lived there throughout her parents' residency and in fact had a tree house built for her on the lawn where during the summer, she would have sleepovers with her friends under the watchful eye of the Secret Service. Uh, Amy went on to illustrate a book, The Little Baby Snoogleflieger, which was written by her father years before she was born, um, which of course she has many other achievements in addition to that. Uh, most people, including Rosalind, were pretty surprised when the run for the presidency was announced by Jimmy. The campaign kicked off in 1975 and the headquarters were in the old train depot in Plains. Rosalind was very involved in Jimmy's presidential campaign and was actually so exhausted, she didn't really wanna wash her hair at night, so she actually wore a wig. Uh, she recalls even her mother didn't know she was wearing one. Win with a grin, heal the nation with peanut oil, let's carterize the country, were a few posters held by people in the crowds during the campaign. However, one of the negatives during the campaign were those who would claim, quote, anybody but Carter, which they refer to as ABC. Uh, so she campaigned separate from Jimmy. And one of the main things she said she learned as she traveled the country was that although people live in different regions, have different lives and jobs, all people are the same and have the same worries and desires. She had even previously said, quote, it was the governor's mansion that I realized that people are just people, no matter who they are or how famous or powerful or influential, they have simply had more experience or more opportunities or a special talent. And I was not as intimidated by them as I once thought I would be. Election night was particularly tense due to the back and forth of the polls, but after getting the news that they had won, Jimmy made a speech in front of the campaign depot in Plains and Rosalind recalls tears rolling down her cheek because she had never been so proud of him. She was actually the first candidate's wife to make a campaign promise of her own, which was that she would launch legislation reform for the mentally ill and would often refer to involve herself in what she called matters of substance. She also traveled the country for a couple of years prior in order to boost his image and help secure the nomination. Jimmy Carter said that he came um, to Washington determined to change the way government worked. His informal public image helped him with that task. After promising in his inaugural address to return government to the people, the president and first lady, Rosalind Carter, walked hand in hand down Pennsylvania Avenue from the Capitol to the White House, 
rather than ride in a limousine, a tradition not seen since Thomas Jefferson back in 1801. Although the inauguration experience was exhausting, she ultimately remembers it as, quote, euphoric. Rosalind was the 39th first 39th First Lady from 1977 to 1981, and used her simple Southern kindness, grace, and values, as well as a willingness to laugh at herself to charm not only the American public, but also DC politicians. She became known as Steel Magnolia, and ultimately kind of resented the nickname, and was described as having her own brand of smiling reassurance. Rosalind once said, quote, you can make a first lady's job whatever you want it to be. And she really made the most of it and became, again, one of the most impactful. Uh, she became one of the most active and influential first ladies since Eleanor Roosevelt and was so much more than just a wife because of her close working relationship with her husband. Jimmy claimed she is, quote, a perfect extension of myself and a very equal partner. She was actually so up to date on what was going on that Jimmy often said that when he would come home, she could only listen to a few words about a problem and be able to discuss it with him without him having to explain it to her for hours. She would then follow the conversation by saying, quote, well, what are you gonna do about it? So some have said that this has made her one of the most powerful unelected officials in the country. She attended and observed cabinet meetings, which raised some eyebrows, as well as lobbied before Congress. Uh, she also assisted in writing his speeches and helped plot political strategy. In fact, during one such cabinet meeting while taking notes, she slipped into the vice president's chair during his absence. Uh, Rosalind said, quote, the president of the United States cares what I think. I find myself in the eye of history. I have influence and I know it. Now, once a week uh, were their working luncheons where the freewheeling agenda would include discussing the status of the White House staff, campaign plans, lobbying efforts, all the way to the latest status of China, Iran, the Middle East, but as well as domestic policies. She used a folder that was given to her husband in France that was engraved into the leather with Monsieur the President Jimmy Carter on it. And it's where she kept anything she needed to talk about during these lunches. Jimmy had overwhelming respect for her political instincts and her superb judgment. She was very candid publicly that Jimmy consulted her on political affairs and asked her for advice on various issues. She was the first first lady to take an office in the East Wing, which was normally just used by the first lady staff. During her time in the White House, the federal government officially recognized the role of First Lady as a federal position. She was also very involved in his second campaign as he was dealing with the Iranian hostage crisis, which in her book refers to Iran as, quote, the four letters that have become a curse to her. And that was also the beginning of the end. Uh, Jimmy's principal footprint will remain achievements like the Camp David Accords between Egypt and Israel the championing of human rights and solar power. Uh, once they had moved into the White House, Jimmy's favorite room became the Treaty Room, which had mostly furnishings that had been added by Ulysses S. Grant, and it included the table that Grant signed the treaty ending the Spanish-American War. Now that table was eventually used to sign the historic treaty between Egypt and Israel. Uh, during her time as First Lady, Rosalind visited Jamaica, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru, Brazil, Colombia, and Venezuela as the president's personal representative, which included meetings involving everything from human trafficking to beef exports. She also greeted Pope John Paul II as the first American representative when he made the list in 1979. In that same year, Rosalind also raised millions of dollars for the Cambodian refugee crisis and traveled there to see the situation for herself. She ultimately convinced the United Nations to create a world relief coordinator and got Jimmy to increase uh, quotas for refugees, accelerate Peace Corps efforts, and allow food delivery in that area. Uh, however, she has stated that her greatest disappointment was not being able to push through the passing of the Equal Rights Amendment. 
the ERA was huge, uh, huge issue in the 70s. Uh, prior First Lady Betty Ford and Rosalind ushered in a new era of the kind of how the public viewed the role um, through advocating for the ERA. Uh, but because it was still seen as mostly a social role um, in regards to being a first lady, they faced a lot of backlash and were condemned. At one point, back when she was first lady of Georgia, Jimmy once said at a press conference that he was for the ERA, but that Rosalind wasn't. Uh, and she was a little upset. So the next day, she went to the Capitol building to meet him for lunch and made sure to wear her large I'm for the ERA pin. Uh, the ERA became a larger issue in 1978 when Phyllis Shapley, who was a conservative political advocate, um, especially against women's rights and the ERA, targeted both parters. Rosalind responded by not only denouncing radicals, but by also reassuring housewives this was in their best interests and attempted to turn the focus for women to their poverty situations, unemployment, health care, and education for the women. Uh, she had a bit more to do with Betty Ford as well, uh, such as arts and culture. Um, and this also included a few SNL skits uh, featuring Gilda Radner as Barbara Walters. Um, and this was in 1976. Um, there was also a few other SNL skits, which Dan Aykroyd played Jimmy Carter. Um, so now I'm going to show you just a short clip um, and this is courtesy of NBC, um, and again from Betty did judge her a bit on her waving at everyone. Uh, Betty also canceled their appointment to meet to show her around the family living quarters, noting she wasn't feeling well, but Gerald Ford insisted Rosalind come anyway because it would look bad to the press if they didn't have the meeting. So they briefly met and she recalls Betty was very cordial. She was extremely successful in her work advocating for mental illness, which included the passing of the Mental Health Systems Act of 1980 and is a cause she continues to advocate for today. Her goal was to take away the stigma of mental illness and create awareness that many deal with emotional and mental health in some way, whether it be themselves or a family member. Uh, and this was especially in order to help those suffering to feel comfortable enough to seek help and treatment. As a young girl, she was introduced to a person with developmental issues and was able to make this a priority even when she was First Lady of the state of Georgia. During this time, she also served on the Georgia Special Olympics chair and volunteered at an Atlanta hospital, which all gave her the professional background to propose federal mental health reform legislation. Uh, she was also very involved with projects aiding senior citizens and caregiving, which included lobbying for the Age Discrimination Act. Rosalind was always disappointed that the press would rather talk about her fashion and what she served at parties instead of her favorite causes. In fact, she chose to wear the same gold embroidered sleeveless coat over the blue chiffon gown uh, she had worn in 1971 for Jimmy's inauguration as governor of the Peach State to his presidential inaugural ball, which caused a little bit of controversy. Although she was stylish, many felt there should be more glamour in the White House, uh, but she wasn't very interested or concerned with that sort of thing. Uh, but she was very concerned about her physical condition and tried to exercise daily, sometimes jogging with Jimmy. Uh, she was also very down to earth because she decided to use the staff offices in the East Wing so that she didn't have to dress up or put on makeup every day. In addition to their political work, both Carters placed national attention on the performing arts. They frequently attended the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, especially attending musical pr productions. So much in fact, Jimmy has claimed they attended more than any other first family. And Rosalind also would often go to lectures there as well. 
Uh, they took basically as many opportunities to learn as they could, including signing up for art programs, taking Spanish les lessons, which included reading the Bible in Spanish before bed, and she utilized that during her trips to South America. And uniquely enough, another uh, study that they did was speed reading. Uh, Rosalind also took violin lessons alongside Amy when she was 11. However, their duets uh, have yet to receive any ray of reviews from White House staff who have been subjected to the performances. Uh, she also sponsored the first jazz festival and the first poetry festival at the White House, as well as a series of classical music concerts. And during the winter holidays, held a gathering on the lawn for congressional families that even included a skating rink. Uh, they also continued to host musicians. In 1977, the Carters hosted Jim Carter Cash and John Cash, as well as their son John, to a reception held for participants of HIRE, which stood for Help Through Industrial Re Retraining and Employment. Uh, state dinners especially were always considered to be, as she said, in her words, the most glittering events. And it seems they may have had some of the most far out parties and guests during their time at the White House. Now, unlike many former presidents and first ladies, the Carters were never interested in fame when they left the White House. Wanting more of a simple life, they returned to their hometown in Georgia. They both continued working for social justice and human human rights. As a former first lady, she formed the Carter Center along with her husband in 1982 in Atlanta, where she has been a leading advocate again for mental health, uh, but as well as early childhood immunizations, uh, human rights and issues, especially affecting women and children. And she has done that for decades. She also formed Project Interconnections, a nonprofit providing housing for mentally ill homeless people. In 1998, she and other uh, three of the former first ladies held a conference called Women and the Constitution, which focused on the impact the document has had on women. Uh, she has written five books, which not only included her autobiography, but also books written alongside her husband, as well as a co-author on caregiving and helping those with mental illness, as well as books promoting human rights. She also served on the board for the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving, uh, which was established in her honor at her college alma mater. In addition, Rosalind was also dedicated to women and children's issues. In 1991, uh, with uh, her early childhood immunization, uh, she launched Every Child by Two, um, which publicized the need uh, for early childhood immunization. Um, she also had a passion to bring awareness to the declining monarch butterflies. And in 2013, the Rosalind Carter Butterfly Trail was established to continue advocating for the conservation of butterflies and their habitat, as well as helping schools form butterfly gardens. She continues to advocate again for mental health awareness and has even teamed up with former first lady, Michelle Obama on issues regarding PTSD with American soldiers returning from Afghanistan and Iraq. She has been given many awards over the years and was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame in 2001. Uh, she was also a volunteer of the decade from the National Mental Health Association and very notably received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Today, Rosalind Carter continues her volunteer work, especially with Habitat for Humanity. In 1984, they started the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Work Project, a yearly week-long project that has taken place in different places all over the globe. Even as recently as 2019, they were seen here working with their tool belts on habitat sites. Um, again, most recently right here in Nashville, where I'm coming to you live from. Uh, Rosalind and Jimmy just celebrated uh, their 74th wedding anniversary, making them the longest married presidential couple, and will celebrate their 75th in July of this year. They have four children, 12 grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren. Jimmy Carter once said, Rosalind is probably the most influential person in my life. Now, in addition to her family and volunteer work, uh, she has enjoyed fly fishing, bird watching, swimming, and biking in her free time. Actually, in May of 2010, she uh, even 
uh, traveled to throughout the U.S. to carry the message of her work, including a guest appearance um, on The Daily Show. The Carters are also very involved in their Baptist church, to which they have recently been able to return to services. Jimmy, as well as Rosalind, used to teach Sunday school classes, drew Democratic presidential candidates and visitors from all over the country for decades. Rosalind has said, quote, I believe that one of the most important things to learn in life is that you can make a difference in your community, no matter who you are or where you live. And second quote, kindness is the connection that links us all together and strengthens the bonds within our communities, neighborhoods, and families. Now, one of the slight scandals during this administration was the Carter son smoking marijuana in the White House with Willie Nelson, which Jimmy has recently confirmed. Now, the Carters continue their friendship with several musicians, but also and especially Willie. So now I'm going to show you a short clip of the Carters singing Amazing Grace with Willie back in 2016. as simple down-home Southern style, they also weren't picky eaters. Rosalind would often take the time to talk with the White House kitchen staff about some of their family's favorite meals so they could cook them to their liking. One of their favorite recipes was red beans and rice, which they called red and white. Uh, Jimmy actually taught Rosalind uh, how to cook this recipe when they first married and they would frequently cook meals together. She was actually an enthusiastic cook and found it relaxing. However, when they were first married, she says she could only cook breakfast, chocolate fudge, and brownies, but also remembers, quote, shelling peas and snapping beans and cleaning up after meals, but that her mother had basically done all the cooking. Now, peanuts ultimately became a symbol of the Carter family as Mr. Peanut was actually a campaign mascot, as well as a group of Georgians who traveled around the country advocating for the Carters, and they were known as the Peanut Brigade. Uh, now, even, even so, the Carters ate no more peanuts than any other family. Uh, Dizzy Gillespie uh, also even invited Jimmy to come sing Salted Peanuts when they hosted a jazz festival on the White House lawn. Uh, even though we'll be making her recipe for peanut butter pie this evening, grits, uh, which was referred to as the grits factor, were served for their first breakfast at the White House and was seen as a symbol of their Southern style of living. Uh, most recently, they were pictured kissing on New Year's Eve during their hometown's annual peanut drop, which is a cardboard cutout of a peanut, this year decorated with blue lights uh, in honor of the state going blue this year during the election. So better keep on stepping. So uh, let's start cooking. Thanks, Sarah. That was an awesome introduction to the cooking presentation. <laughs> Okay, uh, so we have our cocktail over here. Well, the first thing that we're going to make um, is uh, Rosalind Carter's cornbread. Um, so this is a, a really cool and just really simple recipe uh, for cornbread. And I've kind of um, already uh, put some things together, uh, but we'll kind of go through the recipe. Um, so in here, I have um, one stick of melted butter. Um, in this, I have a half a cup of uh, yellow cornmeal, excuse me, half a cup of white cornmeal, um, as well as one cup of flour, um, a half a teaspoon of salt, as well as a tablespoon of sugar, and four teaspoons of baking soda. So we'll just mix that in with our butter. And you are ultimately going to bake this on 425 degrees uh, for about 20 minutes. So although we won't be able to uh, finish cooking 
this particular cornbread, I do have a finished cornbread product to show you. Um, so then you're also going to add in um, one cup of milk. And really, that is all you do. And then you want to make sure that your pan is uh, greased up. And then once you get your cornbread mix all mixed up, and again, I, uh, a little background about myself, um, I went to school um, for history, um, and I'm not a chef. Um, I do enjoy it. Um, so uh, I hope no one out there who is possibly and most likely a better cook than I am uh, won't uh, judge me on this, but um, so we'll uh, just put our cornbread into our pan here, which I will cook later. And really, that is as simple as that recipe gets. And again, they loved eating this with what they called red and white, um, red beans and rice. There we go. And I'll grab out a spoon just to flatten this down just a little bit. And uh, I will bake this on. 425, again, for about 20, 25 minutes. Of course, you want your toothpick to come out clean. Here we go. So you'll have this, and I will show you our finished cornbread product. So you, after you do all, just that very simple little bit, you'll have a, a beautiful plate of Rosalind and Jimmy Carter's uh, cornbread. All right, so the next thing that we're going to make um, is uh, Rosalind's peanut butter pie. Um, so, and it is delicious, by the way. Um, so, of course, you want to start with your pie crust. I'm just using a pre-made pie crust. Um, she did not have a pie crust recipe um, in her particular um, recipe. So, we're just using pre-made. Um, and what you're going to want to do first is take one and a half cups of peanut butter and a cup of powdered sugar. And just combine those two, and we'll just set this aside for a moment. And also, um, I want to add, we should add the one egg into our cornbread. Um, so I'll add that in later, so I apologize. Um, so uh, now what we're going to do um, is, uh, what we need to do is separate our eggs, because uh, the top of the peanut butter pie is going to have a little bit of a meringue. Um, so, um, meringue usually works a little bit better if you do it fresh. So I'm going to um, separate out my egg whites and egg yolks, and we're actually going to use our egg yolks. So what I like to do in an effort to, um, as I'm sure most people would love, is less dishes. Um, I put my egg whites just directly into my mixing bowl for the meringue. And then pop my egg yolks uh, just right in there. So we'll, we'll um, do this um, for just a second. And I dropped the whole egg yolk into that one. So I'll scoop it out. Um, again, oh, um, but I did want to share to you, um, Rosalind really wasn't interested in fashion. Uh, not only, of course, did she wear her inaugural dress twice, uh, but when uh, Jimmy, um, was elected uh, governor, uh, and again, when he was elected president, she once attended Mark Twain tonight at the Kennedy Center wearing the same beige jumpsuit and navy blouse that she'd been wearing all day. Um, so to some, that was um, a little uh, strange for a first lady, uh, but I totally agree with it. Now, Jimmy, he isn't very uh, interested in fashion either. Um, he often shops for his clothes at the Dollar General, in fact. All right. So we have our egg yolks, we have our egg whites. Don't make my mistake of dropping your full yolk in there. Um, and so now we're going to make our filling. Um, so what we're going to do, I'm going to step over here to the stove and grab this. So I have in here... Uh, one and a half, or one, I'm sorry, excuse me, half a cup of sugar and one fourth cup of cornstarch. Um, so to that, we're going to add two cups of milk. 
and our three egg yolks. So we'll warm this up a little bit. And you'll kind of want to really keep an eye on it, um, kind of stir it constantly. Um, and then once it thickens up, we're going to add in uh, some butter and some vanilla. So we'll let that get heated up for just a second. Um, and while we do that, I'll share with you, uh, the Carters again, very simple. Uh, they live in the same ranch style home they built back in 1961 uh, in their hometown of Plains, Georgia. Uh, and most recently, and I'll share this picture and you can probably, uh, of course, look it up online. Uh, but recently, current First Lady Jill Biden and current President Joe Biden visited the Carters um, at their home in Plains, Georgia. Um, and of course, this picture has caused a little bit of controversy because of whatever the angle the picture was taken uh, kind of makes the Carters uh, look a little small. Um, so here we go. And I absolutely love that you can see, um, and especially if you look this up online, um, that it literally looks almost as if you're visiting at your grandparents' house. So it really um, shows exactly who the Carters really are um, as just such kind of simple and humble people. Um, also, while we are uh, warming up this, um, we are going to make our meringue, which I hope sets up because again, I kind of already messed up, but um, the last time I did this, it didn't. So what you'll want to do ultimately to make the meringue uh, is beat your egg whites until they kind of uh, start forming some steep pits and keep. And then uh, we're going to add in um, a little bit, three tablespoons of sugar, a little tiny pinch of salt, um, as well as one teaspoon um, of vanilla. And so um, I will add that in as soon as this starts going. And it's getting a little foamy now, so we'll go ahead and add in our uh, sugar, vanilla, and salt mix. And our mixture over here on the stove for the uh, peanut butter pie filling is looking really good. I think our meringue is going to set up really nicely, so that's awesome, because meringue, I think, is not one of the easiest um, things uh, to make. In addition to our peanut butter and powdered sugar mix that we're going to add to what's on the stove once it thickens up a little bit, uh, we're also going to add in vanilla and two tablespoons of butter. Um, I'll also share with you um, another one of my favorite uh, Rosalind Carter quotes um, while we're waiting. Um, and she just once has said, a leader takes people where they want to go. Uh, a great leader takes people where uh, they don't necessarily want to go, but ought to be. So I just think 
Um, she just has such a great outlook on her on life and different things like that. Um, now at home, uh, Rosalind, uh, they do still cook. And in fact, they actually supposedly make their own yogurt. thick enough but I'll bring it over here and we'll add in the rest of our ingredients. And I'm not sure if our meringue is going to turn out, which happened to me the last time, but I do, again, I have a finished product um, that I'll share with you. Alright, so if you can see, we've got a really kind of thick mix here. And then we are just going to add in our butter and vanilla. And stir that in really well. And then we'll add in our powdered sugar and peanut butter. And then one of the other uh, random facts about Rosalind um, is that she actually was once pictured with a serial killer. Um, I, I wish I could see the chat from here, but I wish anybody, uh, if you want to take a guess as to who you think that serial killer might be um, in the chat, um, because I was blown away. So if anybody can think back to 1970s serial killers. I remember this story. Maybe make a guess. And maybe if Robert, Robert, do you know this? Do you know this? Yeah, actually I do. Um, so someone said Son of Sam. Two guesses for Son of Sam. Um, one guess for Charles Manson. <laughs> and then someone guessed the correct answer, but we won't give that one away. See if there's any other guesses. It wasn't, it wasn't the Son of Sam and it wasn't Charles Manson. See any other, oh, Oh, Ted Bundy gets two votes. <laughs> all, good, all good guesses. Yes, See, all very was... prolific serial killers. I don't know if anyone on here, if you're into true crime, which I am also. Oh, so someone named K K M knows the answer. Oh, yeah, someone, Jeffrey Dahmer. Documentary on Netflix. So people, are, people are kind of reading off all the famous serial killers. And K M knew the answer. The correct answer is John Wayne Gacy. Yes. Uh, they were pictured in uh, May of 1978, prior to his later arrest in December of that year. Um, and I also, you can look this up as well, but I did print off it. Here is uh, Rosalind and John Wayne Gacy. Um, and he's uh, wearing an S on his lapel. And that was indicating that he'd been given security clearance. Uh, and this actually ultimately kind of turned out to be a little bit of an embarrassment for the Secret Service. Uh, but ultimately the picture uh, was signed to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. And of course, she didn't know, of course, what a monster he was. But. Yeah, he kind of had a respectable life outside of his side <laughs> hobby until he got caught. All right, so yeah, once we clown, get our- The clown killer. Yeah, he was known as the clown. He dressed up like a clown sometimes. And I put our peanut butter mix in here. Um, and in order to finish up my pie, I will have to restart my meringue just a little later. So I apologize, I can't show you that part, but every time I try to do it live, it never turns out. I'm not sure why. Um, it's a curse, I guess. Um, but you'll have your lovely pie filling. Um, and what you will ultimately do is uh, put your meringue on top. Um, and then you're gonna bake this on 400 uh, for about 10 minutes or at least until it's browned on top and you'll get a beautiful, delicious peanut butter pie. So don't be intimidated by the meringue because um, normally again, even myself, who's not a trained professional cook, 
Um, it usually turns out, but for whatever reason, I'm cursed when I try to do it on any sort of program like this. Um, okay, so our last recipe is um, the absolute easiest recipe, um, which is, of course, a great thing. Um, but this is Rosalind Carter's Plains, Georgia cheese ring. Um, so basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna take um, a pound of cheddar cheese, um, one cup of chopped pecans, half a cup of mayonnaise, um, and a half a cup of chopped onions, as well as a dash of cayenne pepper. Um, I'm gonna grab another spoon. Um, and then you're just literally just going to mix all of that together. And then once we kind of get all this in the same bowl, um, then we're gonna do six turns, as it says in her recipe, of black pepper. Um, now this is one that you are gonna wanna make ahead if you're planning on serving it in any sort of way because you do have to refrigerate this for um, three hours at least. Um, so um, just as a heads up, but again, I do have a finished product um, that I will share with y'all. And we'll do our six turns of black pepper. And then you literally just stir it up. It's very simple. Um, and if you're not into spicy, um, you could admit, uh, omit the uh, cayenne pepper um, or things like that. Maybe use a little less or a, a little more if you like things spicy. I like a lot of things a little spicy, but um, you just mix this up real good. And then what you'll do is, and you can put it in any type of mold that you want. Um, and since I don't have a mold that this necessarily fits in uh, to have to make it a, a ring itself, I use just a little dish and press it down in the center so that when you ultimately turn it out, um, you have that little ring in the center. Now, one of the things uh, with this is, is you serve it with Ritz crackers which I'll bring the finished product over here. We'll add our Ritz, Ritz crackers to it. And uh, one of the things uh, that she um, kind of added to this and made it a little unique is strawberry preserves. So it was served with strawberry preserves in the center. So you'll just put it in your mold. Again, any mold of any kind. And then I just, again, press that down in the center of my mold um, to make the little dish um, for the center. And you can either keep the dish in the center um, or remove it um, if, it's, if you have a little more circular uh, dish. And then uh, there you'll have it, your plain Georgia cheese ring. Um, so I'll grab the finished product over here. And I'll bring our uh, peanut butter pie over here as well, with all of our items. And so here you'll have uh, Rosalind Carter's Plains Georgia Cheese Ring uh, with your strawberry preserves um, in the center. Um, so um, I, I'm gonna add my Ritz crackers around the edge um, and that's just how she did it. So of course, if you like a different kind of cracker, you can always go with that as well. Uh, but um, this is what the recipe ultimately calls for. Um, so um, I really hope that y'all enjoyed um, learning a little bit about Rosalind as well as Jimmy um, and the Rockin' 70s. And um, I will, of course, stick around if anyone has any questions, which I'll do my best to answer. Um, and uh, again, I hope you thought that depending on where you're tuning in from, either this afternoon, this morning, or this evening was far out, out of sight, um, and just totally dynamite, as they would have said on the popular 1970s show, Good Times. Uh, so so I, hope, <laughs> I hope Robert will invite me back to do another program. Of course and we will. <laughs> again, I hope you all enjoyed it, and thank you so much for um, tuning in and spending your time, and again, you can uh, check out more of my things on my Instagram, at Cooking with the First Ladies. Um, or um, also um, the uh, previous
Grace Coolidge program on DC culture, um, as well as um, the National First Ladies Library, who also has several pre-recorded videos um, that I've done as well. So uh, just as a final little presentation for y'all here, we have our Plains Georgia cheese ring, our cornbread and uh, peanut butter pie, as well as our peanut butter cocktail. And again, I highly recommend uh, this book um, and you can find it relatively um, inexpensively. I actually got mine for 75 cents at a used bookstore. Um, and I think it's worth um, tons more than that, um, but it is um, a really great book. So um, again, thank you all so much and I'll be here for any questions. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. That was fabulous. So I just wanted to give a sh shout out. We have some friends that are joining us today all the way from Paris, France and the Paris France events meetup group. So thanks for joining us. That was awesome. Um, so you brought up a bunch of really good points. It was neat that you mentioned how um, recipes just in general can be customized if someone doesn't want to follow it exactly the way it was um, put in. So that was cool. So appreciate that. There was a few questions earlier. Let's see. Daphne asks, can you use skim milk or does the milk need to have fat in it? Um, I used uh, 2% um, okay. milk, but I, I really, in, in any sort of cooking, in my opinion, again, not, not a professional chef, um, so, okay. uh, but I, I would say you can use any, any milk. Um, okay. as well as any peanut butter. Um, it has to be creamy for the recipes that I described today, but um, I don't think that that matters if you use organic or, um, you know, store brand, et cetera. So that also in regards to the peanut butter. Right, okay. And then let's see, there was a question about, has a butterfly been named for her yet? I don't know about that one. That is a super great question, whoever asked that. And now I literally want to go and Google it right now. Um, and I don't know, but there should be. And then what about, did the Carters ever, I haven't seen this, did they ever um, uh, talk about what the reason, I mean, the, the approaching a 75 year milestone in a marriage is pretty amazing. And they're both incredible people, but do they give any like marital secrets on what's the secret? I haven't, I don't recall, I remember talking about stuff like that. I mean, they talk about their marriage and how happy they are and how much they love one another, but like, hey, what are the, what are the Carter tips to making it to 74 years in marriage? Uh, I don't know all of them. And I, honestly, they're, I mean, they're just, they're very public of course and, and whatnot. But um, honestly, I would really just, I mean, in my, from what I know of researching about them, from what they have said is literally they were they're just very much equal partners just mm -hmm. in everything and they just mm -hmm. have so much just respect for one another that i think that that really makes it work for them mm -hmm. uh, but other than that i don't know um anybody out there who's tuning in and i said this the last time i did rosalind if anybody knows her just pass that info along <laughs> i'll ask her myself and report back <laughs> um, but uh i really honestly i just think they were they're just they're from the same hometown they um have always just been very uh together and everything that they've done um and just really seem to enjoy each other's company so uh in multiple different ways so i'm not exactly sure but i would say from my standpoint it's those are the things that i see that make their marriage really work oh yeah and then mindy asked did you grease the mold beforehand no you don't have to grease your cheese molds beforehand but you do need to grease your cornbread uh pan before okay and then it's just kind of some general questions so what was the first one of these um cooking dishes that you made from the first ladies like can you tell us about like your very first experience that you had about this yes and it was absolutely terrible um, wow. so uh of course I, I i did my i just went straight through you know chronologically so i of course i started with martha washington um and in the first lady's cookbook uh one of her recipes was for beef steak and kidney pie um now if you head over to my Instagram and go back through my little stories all the way to Washington. You can see my original reaction to tasting this recipe. Uh, but um, 
drove out to a local meat market, got the, the beef kidneys. I followed the recipe to the team. Again, my husband was helping me too. He was really excited. He loves liver and onions, um, which I do not, but he was very excited to try this. Um, I should have known it wasn't going to go well when the person at the local meat market was like, good luck with the kidneys, you know, um, it was, it was awful. And it literally tasted like urine. I don't know how else to describe, but, um, so that was terrible. And that was my very first recipe that I did with this project. And I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. Uh, but from there, it was actually all uphill and really haven't cooked anything that I have said, I will never, ever, ever eat this again. But I will give props because my daughter who uh, is 13, uh, just turned 13, uh, has tried every single recipe, no matter what it is that I've made. Um, so I was proud of her that even though we said, ew, she went ahead and at least took one bite of it. Then we just dump that in the trash and we'll never do it again. Wow. Yeah, that is amazing. So that <laughs> no was the offense to was... anyone watching if you like kidneys or maybe know a better way to cook them, but that was not for me. Yeah, Leona just typed that my mom would soak the kidneys for days before and before preparing them. So maybe that's, that's probably a good point. I soaked them, I think the rest, because I just originally especially followed the recipes exactly as they said um, in the book. Um, and I think this was, I think we just only soaked them for maybe two hours. So oh, that possibly might be a factor. I'm not sure that I'll ever attempt it again, just in general, but um, so that was my very first. And um, what am yeah, I so, say? Oh, I was just gonna say, so maybe Leona, you can tell us what is that? So Leona mentioned again, that my mom would soak the kidneys for days before preparing them. So Leona, if you're still listening, maybe you can tell us what that does to it. Let's see, I think we soaked ours in maybe red wine. I don't know if, we, if you'll write in there what your mom might soak them with, but I think that's what we soaked it in. Okay. Uh, but again, I was following just to the T Martha Washington's recipe. But in Martha's defense, um, she has a wonderful recipe for great white cake. Um, which she uh, served frequently at parties and different things. And um, if you're interested in that sort of thing, you can actually just go to the Mount Vernon uh, website and uh, they actually feature that recipe on their page. And so that was the, that first one was the only one that you had that was a kind of thumbs down from the, <laughs> the Sarah Morgan family. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, I would assume a lot of people, and again, which is a great point. Again, not a professional chef, but I, so I'm sure there's probably wonderful ways to cook the kidneys, but whatever I follow that recipe, uh-uh. But uh, again, from there, it was all up and up on recipes. Okay, well, Leona just chimed in. So thanks, Leona. She said that her mom um, soaked them in water, but she changed the water often. She cooked a German sweet and sour kidney dish and used ginger snaps for the gravy so okay that's oh. good well, that's awesome well thank you um thank Leona, you. appreciate that now what about for your family um what have been their favorite dishes yourself and your daughter and your husband's what what are the um, things you like the best uh well since i'm i'm here in tennessee um i you know of course have been to andrew jackson's home the hermitage multiple times and when i was cooking for uh rachel jackson originally i went back up to the Hermitage, take a tour. I happened to talk to one of the guides, sort of explain what I was doing. And they said, oh, the Jacksons loved grape salad. Um, and so they kind of gave me a little idea of how to make that wonderful recipe for grape salad. Um, so love that one. Um, I also, um, and this is also mostly my, my family and they request it often. Um, and this is actually going to be my next live program for the National First Ladies Library. But again, Robert, hopefully um, I'll do it for y'all too, if you want me to. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, come anytime. <laughs> yeah, is uh, Jackie Kennedy um, in July. Um, and her beef stroganoff recipe is fantastic. Um, I don't know that it's really any different than a normal recipe for that, but 
it, it was a real popular hit, as well as any of the desserts. So the, the desserts are a big hit in the Morgan household. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and the and my neighbors and you know different things because when you make this much pie, you gotta spread it around a little bit. Yeah, we should do Jacqueline Kennedy in July because that's her birthday. We usually do try and find, uh, do Jacqueline yeah. Kennedy stuff um, for her birthday, um, so that's cool. What about um? Who, not we'll ex maybe exclude Rosalind Carter. Who's your favorite first lady? That was like our icebreaker question earlier. And um, just for myself, I really like Jacqueline Kennedy and Eleanor Roosevelt. I like Betty Ford because I'm from Michigan. I mean, I like a lot of the first ladies. But um, do you have a particular favorite yourself? Uh, yeah, I I do as well. And um, actually, I was about to say Grace Coolidge. Oh really? Oh okay. And what what do you for those of that weren't on the first program? What do you like so much about her? Uh, well, uh, well, first and foremost, the 1920s and the Roaring Twenties, it, it just sort of is a, is a really uh, interesting time for me um, that I love to read about, and research about. Um, but Grace Coolidge specifically was just the epitome of being graceful, <laughs> ironically, um, as well as just had so many cool things that she did. She uh, had the raccoon um, as a pet, which I think is cool. She just loved animals. Um, and um, on top of that, just was a driving force for especially the women's right to vote um, with, you know, even though her son had just passed away, she went and uh, voted in only the second presidential election that any woman had been able to vote in. Um, so she was just a very strong woman as well as a very caring woman. Uh, the Secret Service called her Sunshine. Um, so she's just one of my favorites. And from reading about her so much, it just uh, became a little bit more apparent because ultimately, originally, before starting this project, I would say Jackie Kennedy. And she is still top of my list. Um, but as I've done more research, uh, definitely I just have to say Grace Coolidge. Oh, okay. I, is, I always find the first ladies interesting because they all came from very different backgrounds. Like a lot of the, some of the presidents have similar backgrounds, you know, they were governors or they were in Congress or whatever. And where the first lady is much more diverse in terms of their background, but they always seem to use whatever skills that they had beforehand or um, experiences and bring that to the first lady. Like a, Jimmy Carter talks about how he couldn't have had his political career if Rose would have been running the peanut farm operation. Yeah. <laughs> So is and campaigning and stuff and then bringing those skills to the white house so that's really um really really amazing so what, what about are there other first ladies that you're um like i would imagine a project like this you're constantly doing new recipes and trying new things like just not necessarily for the live programs which is what recipes are you just going to be making in the near future just for yourself to test out any ones in particular I'm going to be honest, uh, y'all have to tune in uh, to my uh, Instagram or something, uh, because um, with the uh, amount of kind of research and writing, et cetera, that it takes and preparation, um, really, these dishes are the last ones that I've honestly really made recently in regards to the First Ladies. Um, so I'm definitely planning on uh, in the next few weeks, a little more time. Um, and I've been trying to go back um, to the beginning of, you know, with the first ladies and kind of go back through and cook some different recipes. Um, so I, I'm sorry, y'all have to stay tuned. because. Oh, I no, it's okay. <laughs> I, did, I, I, I posted I really your Instagram know. page in the chat a couple times and then I'll email it out as well. What about, um, is, I haven't really seen much information come out about um, cooking and like Melania Trump and Joe Biden, but um, is that anything that you've seen in the media, what the two of them have been involved with? Not a lot yet. Um, and I am planning on definitely cooking uh, for Jill. Um, and um, I have to look at my notes. I don't know, I think it's chicken Parmesan, I believe that's one of the recipes that's come out for her. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll definitely be making that at some point and uh, um, hopefully there'll be something else that comes out and I'm sure it's out there but again I, I haven't looked into uh, that one quite as much quite yet but um, I'll definitely be cooking for her and I'm sure they have tons of great recipes and 
Um, I'll look forward to having a completely new first lady to research and write about um, since I've done all the others. Basically. Oh, okay. And what about, here's a little bit of a variant of a question I asked you before, what was your favorite recipe, but that was kind of more in terms of eating it. What someone asked, what's your favorite recipe in terms of just preparing the food? Is there one that you had fun putting together? Oh, that's hard. <laughs> that's really hard. Um, off the top of my head, and I'm, I'm so sorry because I'm blanking on exactly who the first lady was that or was associated with. It was a very old rest like I it wasn't it wasn't Madison but sort of that kind of you know old presidents um it was a vegetable chartreuse oh wow um, <laughs> but um it was I think the coolest because it seemed like it was going to be kind of gross but it actually it turned out to not only be really good but it was also really just a cool way to do it you used to kind of like a little pan and put asparagus tips um, that have been cooked along the side as well as carrots. Uh -huh. um, and then you put a filling in there. Um, and then once you cooked it, then you dumped it out and it's like literally like a vegetable loaf. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it was just kind of fun to make. I've never really made anything like that. Um, so I, I, off the top of my head, probably that one. Okay. And then somebody else asked, do you, do you study the cooking? Um, uh, recipes for any other like historical figures besides first ladies <laughs> no i don't but um i i well solely because i do like cooking but um i'm more in the history part of it's more my thing but um i actually got a really cool book um recently from a friend cooking with princess diana Ooh, i'm sorry <laughs> i said cooking that with princess be, cooking with princess be. diana <laughs> I would love to do that one, um, actually. Maybe Robert, you can email me if you want me to um, to do that one, because I would love to do Princess Diana, who doesn't love her, but I, I would love to branch out from the First Lady. It's just, again, solely because I've cooked my way all the way through, and so I think there would be so many opportunities to uh, present and uh, cook through um, kind of other historical figures. So okay. I hope to do that sometime at some point. And then someone asked about the book that you were referring to. Do you happen to have the, um, the book close by or the, what was the name of it again? I do. It's, it's cooking. I, if you guys just give me one second, I can go grab yeah, yeah. it. Oh yeah, sure. Go ahead. Just give me one second and I will grab it and show y'all. I also, as mentioned earlier, I really, really liked the Rosalind Carter autobiography. If you get a chance, you should uh, read that. It's just really fascinating. All the first ladies have written excellent autobiographies, but her um, was one of my favorite. Really liked it a lot. Okay, ta-da, there it is. So it's called The First Lady's Cookbook. That's awesome. And you have a funny story about how you um, just kind of stumbled across that in a bookstore one day, didn't you say? Uh, yeah, I did. I just at the thrift store, I just happened to be looking through the books and there it was and being a history person, I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And so I bought it. And then uh, my husband uh, saw it on one of our mini bookshelves, which, you know, he's like, can you not buy any more books? But, um, you know, saw that up there and was like, oh, my gosh, you should kind of do that whole Julie and Julia thing from mm -hmm. the uh, that blog and that movie um, and cook it right through and kind of document it and, you know, we'll eat the food. And so <laughs> I did and here we are today. But uh, there's several different editions of this with different covers as well. Same book, same author and everything. But um, at a historic site that I uh, was working for, um, we did a event uh, with First Ladies um, for President's Day and presented that and I had a lady who came and she had the same book but it has a blue cover um and I'm not sure where you can actually buy it online uh but they're out there I have seen used copies um okay. online 
Okay, that's awesome. Well, thanks again so much, Sarah. That was awesome. I just really loved your innovative way to teach people about history and the first ladies and we learn about cooking and get cool ideas for food that we can eat. So yeah, yeah, I'll definitely, we definitely want you to come back again uh, very soon. So I'll shoot you an email when we're done. And thanks again, everyone so much for joining us. And yeah, now thanks, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, and I'll email again the recipes. Um, I'll email both of them. I'll email the Grace Coolidge and the Rose and Carter ones. And then I'll also, I posted in the chat, but I'll email um, Sarah's Instagram page, Cooking with the First Lady, so you can check that out. So thanks again, everyone. Special thanks to Sarah for sharing the dishes with it. Now, what do you do with this food now? Is this, this is your family's meal for tonight? Or <laughs> your, your neighbors are, are well fed? Or our neighbor, my, my co-workers will get uh, uh, at least one of the peanut butter pies. Um, yeah, it will be it will be shared and enjoyed. Be put to good use. Okay, yeah. so it's going to be put to good use. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Well, thanks again, everyone. Especially thanks to Sarah. Have a great rest of your weekend. Stay safe, everyone. And we'll see you all in person soon. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you.